good afternoon today's talk will be will be an expository talk on joseph conrad's novel heart of darkness conrad's heart of darkness originally appeared serially in blackwood's magazine in 1899 it was eventually published as a whole novel in 1902 as the third work in a volume on the titled youth since its publication in youth the novel has fascinated numerous readers and critics almost all of whom regarded the novel as an important one because of the ways it uses ambiguity and to use conrad's own words foggishness to dramatize Marlowe's perceptions of the horrors he encounters. Critics have regarded Heart of Darkness as a work that in several important ways broke many, many narrative conventions and brought, brought the English novel into the 20th century. Now what makes Heart of Darkness more than an interesting travelogue and shocking account of horrors is the way that it details in very subtle ways marlowe's gradual understanding of what is happening in this far off region of the world which was africa congo like many europeans including his creator marlowe longed for adventure and devoured accounts such as those offered by Stanley but once he arrives in the Congo and sees the terrible work as he ironically calls it taking place he can no longer hide under the cover of his comfortable civilization instead all the horrors perpetrated by european traders and agents typified in this novel by the character of codes force him to look into his own soul and find what darkness lies there in the first half of the novel marlow states and i quote the essentials of this affair lay deep under the surface beyond my reach and quote but by the end of his journey he will have peeked beneath the surface and discovered the inhumanity of which even men such as the ones upstanding codes are capable now in order to understand the novel in some greater depth it is important to important to play place the incidents in the novel in a historical context the end of the 19th century as students of history would probably know brought one of the most notable examples of imperialism and genocide in modern memory king leopold ii of belgium who ruled for the period 1865 to 1909 possessed an insatiable greed for money land and power and looked to africa to find them like many other europeans he was intrigued by reports of africa made famous by explorer henry morton stanley whose books titled how i found livingstone adventures and discoveries in central africa published in 1872 and through the dark continent another important work published in 1878 were best selling accounts of his travels through a series of machinations and deluge of propaganda proclaiming his munificence and general kindness leopold eventually secured the congo region of africa as a belgian colony on may 28 1885 Leopold named his new nation the Etat Independent du Congo or the Congo Free State. 
this huge area of Africa remained under Belgium control until as late as 1960. The Congo was a perfect colony for Leopold II for several reasons. First, ivory and rubber were plentiful and could be systematically gathered and shipped to Europe. Second, the only law there was Leopold's, although he constantly presented himself to his European contemporaries, including kings of other European countries. As a philanthropist and humanitarian, Leopold ran the Congo <coughs> sorry, remotely without ever visiting it from a distance with an iron hand. Third, labor in Congo was plentiful and cheap, and more important to Leopold, most of the labor was actually made to be free because his agents there routinely forced the Congolese into slave labor by means of torture or intimidation. Women, for example, were often kidnapped and held until their husbands and sons gathered sufficient quantities of rubber. Fourth, there were few operating expenses as we call them today. Huts and mess halls were constructed for the agents and the construction of a railroad system running through the Congo guaranteed that supplies could reach the remotest parts of Congo and indeed some of the ports closer to Congo very quickly. Finally, the colony was thousands of miles away from sheltered European skies and therefore people could not condemn what they could not see. In other words, Leopold felt safe at the fact that he was imposing a ruthless type of colonialism without his people at home ever knowing it. His agents therefore comprised a chaotic, unforgiving and hateful force determined only to make the most money possible by exploiting the natives often whipping them with a piece of sun-dried hippopotamus hide called a chico, chopping off their hands and heads or killing them by dozens at a time. In his recent study of the Congo, titled King Leopold's Ghost, the historian Adam Hochschild estimates that during the period of Leopold's loot of the Congo, the population of Congo dropped by as much as 10 million. Disease, starvation, a very low birth rate, unlike most of the countries of Africa of that time, and outright murder all combined to turn the Congo into what later, what uh, Heart of Darkness later portrayed as some form of a nightmare. Some observers of the atrocities committed there became noted anti-Leopold activists and launched a partly successful campaign to end Leopold's rule. Other observers transformed what they saw into art, as did Joseph Conrad when he wrote his novel Heart of Darkness. Leopold's Congo and the people, both white and black, who populated it, find their way into the pages of Conrad's novels. The ominous company that hires Marlowe, for example, is a thinly veiled depiction of Leopold's operations in Africa. Leopold's agents in Congo become, according to Joseph Conrad, faithless pilgrims looking for riches that Marlowe describes once he reaches the Congo and the chain gang Marlowe sees at the outer station is a glimpse at the slavery enforced by Leopold's agents. Coots, the first class agent, as described by Conrad in this novel, who commits numerous acts of savagery, including the most remarkable act of placing of the rebels' heads upon posts surrounding his heart, is an embodiment and a very powerful symbol 
of the collective horrors that Conrad witnessed firsthand during his visit to Congo and indeed most parts of Africa. As Marlowe tells his audience on board the Navy, and I quote, In the blinding sunshine of that land, I would become acquainted with a flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of a rapacious and pitiless folly. Unquote. The devil in this context is the greed that motivated the Belgian King Leopold to continue the systematic ravaging of the Congo and its people for more than two decades. Now to go to the central plot of the novel, we find that the heart of darkness begins on the deck of the Nelly, a British ship anchored on the coast of the Thames. The anonymous narrator, the director of companies, the accountant and Marlowe sit in silence. Marlowe begins telling the three men about a time he journeyed in a steamboat up the Congo River. For the rest of the novel, with only minor interruptions, Marlowe narrates his tale. We see that as a young man, Marlowe desires to visit Africa and pilot a steamboat on the river Congo. After learning of the company, which was a large ivory trading firm working out of the Congo, Marlowe applies for and successfully receives a post. He left Europe in a French steamer. At the company's outer station in the Congo, Marlowe witnesses scenes of brutality, extreme chaos and waste. Marlowe speaks with an accountant whose spotless dress and upright demeanor and behavior fascinate him. Marlowe first learns from the accountant of Coates, who is described as a remarkable quote-unquote agent working in the interior. Marlowe leaves the outer station on a 200-mile trek across Africa and eventually reaches the company's central station where he learns that the steamboat he is supposed to pilot up the Congo was actually wrecked at the bottom of the river. Frustrated, Marlowe then learns that he has to wait at the central station until his boat is repaired. Marlowe then meets the company's manager there who told him more about Coates. According to the manager, Coates is supposedly ill and the manager feigns great concern over Coates' health, although Marlowe later suspects that the manager wrecked his steamboat on purpose to keep supplies from getting to Coates. Incidentally, Marlowe also meets the brick maker, a man whose position seems apparently unnecessary in the novel because he does not have all the materials for burning bricks or making bricks. After three weeks, a band of traders called the El Dorado Exploring Expedition, led by the manager's uncle, arrives. One night, as Mar Marlowe is lying on the deck of his salvage steamboat, he overhears the manager and his uncle talk about Coates. Marlowe concludes that the manager fears that Coates is trying to steal his job. His uncle, however, told him to have faith in the power of the jungle to do away, do away within Coates, with Coates. Marlowe's boat is finally repaired and he leaves the central station accompanied by the manager, some agents and a crew of cannibals to bring relief to Coots. Approximately 50 miles below Coots's inner station, they find a hut of leaves, a woodpile and an English book titled 
an inquiry into some points of steamship as it crept towards Kurs. Marlow's steamboat is attacked by a shower of arrows. The white fire rifles into the jungle while Marlow tries to navigate the boat. A native helmsman is killed by a large spear and thrown overboard into the water. Assuming that the drowned natives who are attacking them have already attacked the inner station, Marlow feels disappointed and quite rightly so. Now that he will never get the chance to speak, he says to Coates. Marlow reaches the inner station and notices Coates building through his telescope. There is no fence, but a series of posts ornamented with balls that Marlow later learns were natives' heads. A Russian trader and a disciple of Coates called the Harlequin by Marlow, approaches the steamboat and tells Marlow that Coates is still alive. Marlow learns that the hut they previously saw is the Harlequin's. The Harlequin speaks enthusiastically of Coates' wisdom, saying, and I quote, this man has enlarged my mind. Marlow learns from him that the steamboat was essentially attacked because the natives did not want Coates to be taken away. Suddenly, Marlow sees a group of native men coming toward him, carrying Coates on a stretcher. Coates is taken inside a hut. But where Marlow approaches him and gives him some form of solace through letters and information through letters, Marlow notices that Coates is frail, sick and bored. After leaving the hut, Marlow sees wild and gorgeous, wild and gorgeous within Coates. Native woman approach the steamer. The Harlequin hints to Marlow that the woman is Coates' mistress. Marlowe then bears Kurtz's Kurtz chiding the manager from behind the curtain by telling, Save me, save the ivory you mean, unquote. The Harley Queen, fearing what might happen when Kurtz is on board the steamer, asks Marlowe for some tobacco and rifle cartridges. He then lives in a canoe. At midnight that same night, Marlow awakens to the sound of a big drum. He inspects Kurtz's given, only to discover that he is not there. So Kurtz is missing from his cabin. Now Marlow runs outside and finds a trail running through the grass and realizes convincingly that Coates is escaping by crawling away on all fours. When he comes home, and when he comes upon Kurtz, Kurtz wants him to run, but Marlow keeps Kurtz to his feet and carries him back to the cabin. The next day, Marlow, his crew, and Kurtz leave the inner station. As they move farther away from the inner station, we find that Kurtz's health deteriorates. At one point, the steamboat breaks down and Kurtz gives Marlow a pack of letters and a photograph for safekeeping, fearing that the manager will take them. Marlow complies. One night after the breakdown, Marlow approached Kurtz who is lying in the pilot house on his stretcher, waiting for his death. After trying to reassure Coates that he is not going to die, Marlowe hears Coates whisper his final words, which was the horror, the horror. 
The next day, Kurtz is buried offshore in a muddy hole. After returning to Europe, Marlowe again visits Brussels and finds himself unable to relate to the ethos as well as the theme of the poem, as well as to the sheltered Europeans around him. A company official approaches Marlowe and asks for the packet of papers to which Coates has entrusted him. Marlowe refuses, but he does not give the official a copy of Coates's report to the Society for the Suppression of Savage Customs with Kurtz's chilling postscript where he said, open quotes, exterminate all the groups, exclamation close quotes, torn off. He learned that Kurtz's mother had died after being nursed by Kurtz's intended or fiancé. Marlowe's final duty to Kurtz is to visit his intended and deliver Kurtz's letters and her portrait to her. When he meets her at the house, she is dressed in mourning and still greatly upset by Kurtz's death. Marlowe lets slip that he was with Kurtz when he died and the intended asked him to repeat Kurtz's last words. Marlowe lies to her and says, and I quote, the last word he pronounced was your name, unquote. The intended states that she knew Kurtz would have said such a thing. Marlowe leaves disgust, disgusted by his lie, yet unable to prevent himself from telling it. The anonymous narrator on board the Nelly then resumes his narrative. The doctor of companies makes an innocuous remark about the tide and the narrator looks out at the overcast sky and the river tapes, which seems to him to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. The heart of an immense darkness within quotes. Now, first-time readers of Conrad's Heart of, Heart of Darkness may be initially puzzled by Conrad's repeated insistence and decision to have Marlowe's story told to the reader by the anonymous narrator who listens to Marlowe on the deck of the ship that they are traveling, that is Nelly. Such a reader may wonder why Conrad would make Heart of Darkness a frame tale at all and not simply begin by Marlowe telling the story as many first-person narratives usually do. The reason is that Conrad's frame director, like the reader, learns about his art from European imperialism and are usually founded on a number of lies that, are, that has wholeheartedly delivered. By the end, Marlowe's tale significantly changes the narrator's attitude toward the sun and men of the past. So with this, we come to the end of a very generalized preview and a discussion of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness.